And Mark Stein, in your 2006 book, America Alone, where did that title come from? Uh, I, I ought to uh, confess that that title came uh, from the publisher, from my editor at Regnery, a gentleman called Harry Crocker. I had a far more artful and elusive title that he thought was for losers and would guarantee we sold, you know, 2,800 copies and was <laughs> in the remainder bin. Uh, he thought that was, uh, he thought America Alone was a, a hit title and, uh, and uh, he proved right on that. And what was your original title for? Oh, I'm, I'm keeping that to uh, when I'm a multi-bazillionaire and I uh, can afford to indulge myself by writing books with oblique, elusive titles that sell 2,400 copies, I'm going to revive it. What is that book about? Uh, well, the, 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 the book by, uh, by my original title was uh, on the, the same theme as America Alone uh, eventually turned into. Which, which is uh, civilizational collapse, which is my shtick, as it were, is my little niche. Uh, and, and I think that the, what a good editor does, which is what Harry did uh, for me at Regnery, is he, he identifies what your unique selling point is and he, uh, and he gets you to focus on it. And he says, no, no, all this dan tap dancing around the issue in the first uh, 50 pages is a waste of time. Get rid of that. Go straight in on this, and that's the book. And uh, and uh, he was right on that. He was right on that. And you write in America Alone, the end of the world as we know it. It's hard to deliver a wake-up call for a civilization so determined to smother the alarm clock in the soft, fluffy pillow of multiculturalism and sleep in for another 10 years. The folks who call my book alarmist accept that the wor Western world is growing more Muslim but they deny that this population trend has any significant societal consequences. Yes, that's true. Uh, uh, my book, when it came out uh, in 2006, uh, The Economist called it Alarmist. Uh, my own magazine up in Canada, Maclean's magazine, called it uh, Alarmist. I think, in fact, it was insufficiently alarmist. Um, if you look at, for example, in the Netherlands, you have explicitly Muslim uh, parties organizing in local legislatures now. If you look at the city of Brussels, a uh, majority of people on the city council of the, the governing cor socialist caucus are Muslim. Uh, I was sent a, a picture yesterday of the city of London, uh, the square mile, the, finan the biggest financial center on earth. And uh, the, the nearest Muslim mosque for city workers is too small, so they all uh, take their prayer mats in the street and, and look towards Mecca. And, the, and so on Friday prayers, the streets of uh, central London, this, this street in central London is filled uh, with Muslims looking toward Mecca and praying. And now you can argue that that is, just adds to the general gaiety of life in a multicultural society. Uh, or you, and you can argue that it's going to be a huge blessing, uh, or you can do as I do and argue that in fact it puts a big question mark over those societies. But I think it's ridiculous to pretend that nothing is going to change about uh, a society. There's a difference between, a, uh, if you look at Austria for example, uh, by mid-century it's predicted that a majority of Austrians uh, under the uh, age of 30 will be Muslim. That's what the uh, Vienna Demographic Institute predicted. Now this is a this is a a country that most Americans don't think about. They think about uh, if if you say Austria, they think of Julie Andrews prancing around with the nuns, uh, singing uh, "How do you solve a problem like Maria?" Uh, that that was Salzburg, 1938. Uh, Salzburg, 2038, is uh, "How do you solve a problem like Sharia?" I mean, that's like a complete inversion <laughs> from head to toe in uh, in three generations. You also note in America Alone that uh, the birth, the one of the most popular boys' names in Europe, in several mm. areas of Europe, is Mohammed. Yeah, and <laughs> again, that's one where people say, "Oh, it doesn't." That's just because it has a particular significance in the uh, in the Muslim world, and and they go, "You can only get to that uh, statistic by adding up Mohammed with an O and Mohammed with a U and Mohammed with a double M and Mohammed with one M." Uh, but, but in point of fact, it, it is uh, a, a, a significant uh, marker. Cultural demographic transformation is always the most interesting because uh, who a society's human capital is uh, is the best indicator of where that, uh, that society is headed. And generally speaking, uh, while we, we tell ourselves certain fluffy and reassuring 
stories uh, about demographic transformation, it doesn't always work out well. I mean, sometimes it works out messily in a relatively benign way. I'd say if you take, say, Northern Ireland, which is uh, a place I, uh, I know uh, well, um, that's the, the, frac the, 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 the fractiousness between what Catholics regard as a native population and an imposed Protestant population still linger hundreds of years after. If you look at Fiji, uh, where the uh, British uh, brought in uh, Indians, uh, an Indian population, to be their civil service and mercantile class, uh, Fiji has decayed in, uh, in, in the last couple of decades, tragically, into, uh, in, into a bicultural ruin. So demographic transformation is always, uh, I think, the most fascinating uh, element of society. Why should we care, though? So what? Well, if you if you if you put it in those terms, then uh, we shouldn't care. It's just it's just something that happens. But it never happens uh, entirely naturally. I mean, for example, if you look in the Southwest United States, where uh, cities that were, if you take certain cities on the edge of uh, California, uh, on the edge of Los Angeles, for example, that were. Uh, had a conventional post-war demographic and have now become 90 to 95 percent uh, Hispanic. This is a demographic that wasn't even in the 1960 uh, U.S. Census. That's actually a big transformation in a in a fairly short space of time, and it has uh, uh, and it has consequences. Now, when you put the "why do you care" question, I think I say in America alone, that's that's the benign view that. People think it's like uh, we, we were talking about Broadway just before we went on air. That's like the David Merrick production of Hello Dolly, which he had Carol Channing in, and then he had Ginger Rogers in, uh, and then he ran out of these sort of brassy, uh, middle-aged, uh, blonde broads, and so he put Pearl Bailey in the lead and made it an all-black uh, cast. It's it's still Hello Dolly. The songs are the same, uh, the scripts the same. It's just that it's a uh, 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 Pearl Bailey and an all-black cast. And people think that people think that's what happens, that if you have a Muslim Netherlands or a Muslim uh, Britain, that it will, you know, the Muslim, uh, Muslim Britain, the, there'll be fewer pubs, uh, the pubs will have to close, but essentially it will, it will basically still be the same. And I don't think that's, no, no serious person would argue that, I think. On the cover of the new paperback, or mm. the, the relatively new paperback version of America Alone, there's a little sticker that says, yes. soon to be banned in Canada. That's right. <laughs> I was, uh, as I mentioned, I write f uh, for Maclean's magazine up in Canada, or I did at the time, uh, which is like the combination of Time and Newsweek combined up in Canada. It's the Dentist's Waiting Room magazine, uh, no offence to dentists or to my friends at Maclean's. They published a big cover story from the book, and uh, the Canadian Islamic Congress uh, took against it and filed uh, three human rights complaints. Uh, in the province of Ontario, the province of British Columbia, and uh, at the Federal Human Rights Commission. And as a result of that, I, I've had the bizarre uh, experience of finding my uh, writing on trial in a courtroom in Vancouver, uh, in which they flew in expert witnesses to discourse on the tone of, uh, the so-called tone of my jokes. Were my jokes uh, merely in poor taste, or were they actually criminal? And they flew in, uh, uh, you know, they flew in one of these, uh, an expert witness from Philadelphia and a so-called expert witness from uh, Toronto and all that. And it was, it was fascinating. I mean, I was flat I'm flattered to be on this show and to be discussing my uh, for three hours. Uh, but no disrespect, Peter, when it actually becomes the subject of a criminal trial. <laughs> in a Vancouver courtroom. I thought that was a kind of big, I, th I thought the kind of literary criticism elements of the case were, were as absurd as anything else there. What's the CIC and the Human Rights Commission in Canada? Well, the CIC is the Canadian Islamic Congress. I mean, one of the other interesting features of the demographic transformation is, I mean, that's a reasonable name. I find there's something called, the, I think, the Supreme Islamic Council of Canada or, is the, or the Islamic Supreme Council of, of Canada, which always sounds slightly less uh, friendly to me. I may do them an injustice. I used to be on the mailing list of the Supreme Islamic Council of Ireland, uh, which, who were rather agreeable, in fact. They were rather 
agreeable correspondence. I don't know what Eamon de Valera would have made of it. I mean, I don't quite, or, or Michael Collins, I don't quite see the point of fighting to, sh to, to throw off the hated English oppressor if <laughs> a couple of decades later the Supreme Islamic Council simply sets up shop in Dublin. But be that as it may, all, the Supreme Islamic Council of New South Wales down in Australia, I was also on their mailing list for a while. Uh, but they.